And so the Jason Todd trilogy leads to its final installment with Under the Hood, that four to five years after coming out got red added to it. Remember back in my A Death in the Family video how I brought up that DC back in 1988 left Jason Todd's fate up for the readers to decide by voting on it with two different phone numbers during a 36 hour window. One of those people who voted for Jason's survival was Jud Winnick, who a decade and a half later had managed to get a job working as a writer for DC Comics, initially writing Green Lantern Lantern and Green Arrow before eventually landing on to write Batman's monthly comic. Winnick started out with a five issues long story as The Crow Flies, where during a fear gas induced episode, Batman saw Tim Drake's Robin as Jason the way how he was during the Hush storyline before being revealed as Clayface. Also, Jason's old Robin mask was later discovered from the Batmobile, with Tim not having lost his mask. Then for the next three issues, before Winnick was allowed to start working on the story that this video is supposed to be about, war games happened with the super villain slash crime boss Black Mask taking over Gotham's criminal underworld, which happens to be relevant to the setting of Under the Hood. Also, Oracle and the Birds of Prey moved to New York, with Robin and Cassandra Kane's Batgirl switching cities with Nightwing by moving to Bloodhaven. Once again, thank you to Robert Willing for helping me go over the story, like with most of my recent comparison reviews, and what parts I should focus on during the story commentary, as well as some other relevant stories to focus on later during the review. As usual before we start, here are the time codes for all the acts of the main story, here is where the review part starts, and this is where I will be talking about the 2010 animated movie. Also, because I want to end this Jason Thor trilogy on the tone that it deserves, I'll be asking you my viewers here to remember to like the video, leave comments on how this trilogy has represented the character of Jason Todd, share all three videos in it for more people to see, and subscribe for what will eventually be coming out after it. And now to the final installment of this trilogy. Act 1 the story of Under the Hood begins with an in media res opening of Batman fighting the titular antagonist in a brutally even fight, that eventually leads to his mask being ripped off his face. His opponent, in finding some humor in it, responds in kind and removes his helmet to shock the unmasked Batman of his identity. Five weeks earlier. And as this earlier part of the story begins now in the aftermath of War Games, with Black Mask having taken over Gotham's criminal underworld, Oracle, Robin and Batgirl having moved out of Gotham as Batman's reputation has taken a hit to make the GCPD hostile against them, and Leslie Tompkins allowed Stephanie Brown to die to her injuries. Not really! Meaning that Batman has, in lack for better words, fallen backwards in his career to be alone with just Alfred, who arrives to tell Bruce even more bad news. That Lucius Fox has arrived to tell Bruce that a portion of the Wayne Industries R&D department has been bought over by the Germans. Wir denken, wir haben ein sehr gutes Angebot. Du verspielst deine Zeit! I grudgingly accept. So far, that just means that Bruce won't be getting any new toys, and has to make do with what he has while doing what he usually does. As well as the fact that the toys he was supposed to be getting are now being available in the public sector. Meanwhile, those crime bosses currently banded under Black Mask have been called into a meeting that none of them had set up. And that is how we are introduced to the titular antagonist of the story, as the Red Hood uses the high ground to tell the crime bosses that they work under his paid protection now, along with how they shouldn't be selling drugs to children, or else they end up like the heads in the duffel bag. 
At the same time, Black Mask and his unnamed male assistant are shown to recruit Mr. Freeze as an enforcer and give him an upgraded new suit as an entry fee. Black Mask's current operations include moving shipments of stolen supervillain tech, while his male assistant also informs him about Red Hood having moved into his territory, of which Black Mask has also learned ahead of time. At this point, Black Mask is observing Red Hood who is observing Batman and Nightwing, who stayed over to support Batman after war games, attacking Black Mask's men as they are moving the shipments at Gotham Harbor, with us as the readers getting the Red Hood's narration to comment about it as it's happening. Later, when Batman and Nightwing are done and inspecting the stolen shipment of supervillain take on the cargo ship, one of the boxes is revealed to be booby trapped with explosives that the Red Hood is shown to detonate. After Batman and Nightwing manage to just barely get out of the exploding ship, they notice the Red Hood on the roof and set to pursue him, with us now being treated to Batman's inner monologue as he is mentally commenting on Red Hood's speed, agility, and his reaction speed to counter Batman's ranged attempts to catch him. Eventually, the Red Hood leads Batman and Nightwing into a dark warehouse and sets them up against a prototype Amazo android which luckily doesn't seem to have Wonder Woman's lasso, Green Lantern's ring, or Plastic Man's powers, so Batman and Nightwing have a chance to flee and fight back against it. While they fight Amazo and eventually manage to shoot it to blow up in the harbor, Black Mask is meeting up with Mr. Freeze to discuss the terms of his employment in his criminal organization, which leads to one of his enforcers being killed. I get it. You're unpredictable. I can work with that. Before Mr. Freeze could be given his first assignment, Black Mask is informed about the shipment that Red Hood already set Batman and Nightwing to blow up, and that Amazo has been sent to the bottom of the harbor. As Black Mask has to do phone calls to his buyers, Red Hood also calls him about having managed to save some of the stolen shipment. In this case, a box holding 100 pounds of kryptonite, which Red Hood knows that Black Mask wants to get back. Refusing a job offer first, Red Hood nonchalantly demands for a 50 million return fee. How much? 50 million. 50? What are you trying to budget a movie? Li liquid 50? Is he insane? No, insane ones would make a suit of the rock and march in the metropolis to play King of the Mountain. This one knows what he's doing. Despite recognizing Red Hood as someone who knows what he is doing and agreeing to pay up, Black Mask sends Mr. Freeze to retrieve the kryptonite with the money and orders to kill Red Hood during the exchange. While both parties are on their way to the meetup, Batman and Nightwing are following a tracer they managed to plant onto Red Hood on the Batmobile and comment about how poor their outdated equipment is now that they don't have Oracle to help them out anymore. At the meeting for the money for Kryptonite exchange, Red Hood immediately calls the bluff about the suitcase only having money on the top, with Mr. Freeze confirming that the rest is six inches of newspaper, which causes both sides to open fire and eyes at each other. Red Hood uses hidden automatic turrets to kill most of Mr. Freeze's extra muscle, that Mr. Freeze doesn't really need with his new suit's upgrades. But when Batman and Nightwing eventually make it to the scene, Mr. Freeze goes, Screw you guys, I'm going home. And Red Hood covers his own exit by making Nightwing busy dodging and disabling his automatic turrets. After leaving Batman and Nightwing to awe at the feats he pulled, Red Hood goes to what looks like the ferry grounds that the Joker bought during the killing joke. There he finds a seemingly tired and exhausted Joker, to whom Red Hood then proceeds to give his own version of Gordon Freeman impression, and then asks for feedback while removing his helmet to reveal himself to the audience as Jason Todd. Act 2 Sometime later, Red Hood has dropped all pretenses on trying to do business with Black Mask and is just going after all of his operations with Scorched Earth tactics that not only destroy his merchandise, but also cuts down his manpower. Batman on his end 
has been traveling to all the Lazarus pits that were sealed off after Nyssa killed Raj al Ghul in Death and the Maidens, to make sure that they have not been used with Satana sharing her magical expertise to fact-check his own knowledge on them. While Batman is also visiting Jason Blood as an another source on raising the dead back to life, one of the few vigilantes still left in Gotham named Onyx is keeping an eye on the local criminal activities that Red Hood has seemingly also taken over. Meaning that Nightwing has by now gone back to Bloodhaven, so remember that for what happens later in the video. When she reports about her findings to Batman, he has already visited Green Arrow about his own past death and resurrection, and is now on his way to ask the same thing from Superman. While Batman is in Metropolis, Onyx is caught spying on Red Hood's truck runners by the Red Hood himself, who instead of blowing her cover or fighting her, tells Onyx who the drug runners are along with their criminal records as a justification to invite her to into jumping down and start, quote, kick nine kinds of hell out of that small gaggle of dirt bags. They however end up getting outgunned and are forced to flee outside where Red Hood has hidden a minigun, which he uses to slaughter all the drug runners running at him and Onyx, who naturally is horrified of the act. Red Hood responds to this by turning his minigun at Onyx, and starts to lecture her about the methods that work over methods that don't. He then pins Onyx to the wall, stabbing her to the shoulder so fast that she can see it, and uses it as a way to negotiate her into coming to work for him. Not really! Ultimately, Red Hood pulls his knife out of Onyx's shoulder, and gives her a tourniquet to put pressure onto it by the time Batman arrives, and becomes the target of his violent tendencies. Their fight then leads to that in media res opening where the story began in the first place, to the roofs in the rain where Batman is unmasked by the Red Hood, who then lets Bruce see his face as his lost prodigal son. It takes some time for Bruce to accept Red Hood as Jason, who confesses that they fought before in the graveyard during the Hush storyline, before he switched places with Clayface. Bruce's eventual acceptance, however, ends up being anticlimactic with Jason being apathetic about his homecoming, and eventually flees after giving Bruce a batarang with his blood, tissue, and fingerprints for identification. Jason also promises to Bruce that he is building himself into what Batman is supposed to be with his war on crime in Gotham, before blowing up his Red Hood helmet in making his escape. <laughs> The blood, tissue, and fingerprints on the batarang confirm that Jason has truly come back from the grave. Bruce still tells Alfred to keep Jason's memorial shrine left in its place, as in his mind nothing has changed. Because the Robin that Jason was is still dead, and replaced by the Red Hood in his place. Interlude when it comes to the events of Batman issue 645, I see it as an interlude to the story, similarly as how that actual interlude that Batman Hush story had. The story in it is in a nutshell of how Batman and Alfred unearthed Jason's coffin from his gravesite to examine it for clues to Jason's resurrection. During the examination, Bruce also has flashbacks to his first meeting with Jason when he tried to steal the tires from the Batmobile, in which Judwinik has indeed cut out Magan's voice call out and added some dialogue that Jason was only able to take the tires because of some convenient circumstances. We also get some more flashback scenes of Jason as Robin helping Batman apprehend Captain Boomerang and his gang, as well as what I assume is meant to be a rewritten retelling of the opening scene of A Death in the Family, with Jason disobeying Batman's orders and being reprimanded for it. In the present day, we get a commentary from Alfred about Jason's coffin having been built by the son of the same coffin maker who had built the coffins for Bruce's parents. Alfred commenting on the son's craftsmanship to his father's is so used as an allegory to Jason attempting to surpass Bruce in being a better Batman as the Red Hood, and in the end Bruce has destroyed the son's craftsmanship by dismantling the coffin. Act 3 
In the new status quo where Batman now has to more actively save the criminals from Red Hood's more lethal methods, which Jason admits being something he sadly enjoys watching, Black Mask is way past the point of having had enough of his operations being under attack. And then to add insult to injury, Red Hood lets Black Mask see him aiming a bazooka at his office to see him run for his life before firing armor-piercing rocket at the building. Wow, he sure can move when he really wants to. And just like that, Black Mask has lost all the power he managed to grab for himself during war games. Left just with his male assistant and enforcers he probably can't pay in the long run. While doing some culling on his staff and cutting fat out of it, Black Mask is approached by Deathstroke representing United Villains in the Secret Society of Super Villains on a recruitment drive, which both Batman and Jason in spying on him recognize as a curveball to the current circumstances. Lucky for them, however, where Deathstroke alone could be a powerful enforcer for Black Mask to reclaim his power, he is only here as the middleman and just hands over bottom of the barrel assets. In this case, Captain Nazi and Hyena. The Nazi's blind. Bad Nazi is 135 years old and ran with Hitler, but he's fucking blind. He's damaged good. I thought Hyena was dead. One of them is dead. This is the other one. I thought the other one was a chick. For all I know, this one is a chick. I didn't care to check under the hood. How about you? Pass. Hyena kind of looks like a girl from the back. I was just thinking the same thing. Deathstroke is, however, forcing Black Mask to take what he is getting and that there is a third villain on his way to work for him, who should finish the given combo in what Black Mask needs to take out Red Hood. And so Black Mask has his people set up a trap to draw Red Hood out in the open by threatening a small-time crime boss under his protection, before setting out Captain Nazi and Hyena on him. They somewhat quickly overpower Red Hood, who when pinned down by Hyena claims to be stalling for Batman to show up, and fight by his side by taking out Hyena in his arrival. Here Batman's inner monologue justifies his team up with the Red Hood as a requirement to balance out Captain Nazi's strength with their skills and teamwork from their old, shared and practiced techniques. Batman and Red Hood manage to hold their own against Captain Nazi, until that third villain Deathstroke promised Black Mask was on his way arrives. Count Vertigo, whose powers work physically on eyes and ears, to which Batman has a built-in defenses inside his cowl originally intended against Scarecrow's fear toxins. Flipping his senses between being blind and deaf, Batman tells Red Hood to revive Hyena as Captain Nazi gets back up and attempts to restrain him. Red Hood still manages to do as he is told, while Batman charges at Count Vertigo to tear off a piece of his costume and punches Hyena with it to make Hyena catch Count Vertigo's scent and make the two fight each other. That way, Batman succeeds in restraining them both before turning to demand Captain Nazi to let Red Hood go, but Red Hood instead uses a taser to destroy Captain Nazi's cybernetic eye and make it look like he killed him. Not ready! Taking out Captain Nazi when you know he's gonna eventually come back, him killing the other guy made more sense. Cause not Captain Nazi is a case where, oh yeah, he might be dead now, he'll be back! In fact, the whole him having the, is being blind here was because he got ch chad with needles during um, Villains United. Without them knowing about that, Red Hood flees away from Batman while telling him off and with their terms remaining exactly the same. Around the same time, Alfred calls Batman that Jason has sent a package to the Wayne Manor, which is currently under examination, and Black Mask is meeting with his lieutenants to hear how he should approach the current situation with the Red Hood after the latest failure. Not liking what he hears, Black Mask decides to pay their severance packages in lead, which turns out to be a poorly planned and written part of the story that I'm going to say in advance that I'm happy was changed in the animated movie. 
Pretty much what happens in this part is that Red Hood manipulated Black Mask into executing his lieutenants as terms for peace between them, and then changed his mind or reveals that he was never going to hand over any peace, which then leads to a fight between them. As they are fighting, Alfred reports to Batman that the package contains a lock of the Joker's hair to inform them of his abduction and a card with an address to the location Red Hood and Black Mask are fighting at. And Batman then arrives to the scene when Black Mask has seemingly won by pushing Red Hood's knife into his chest. Not really! No, that was just a fake out cliffhanger ending put between issue 648 and 649, meaning that there was someone else posing as Red Hood during the events of issue 648, and in reality Jason has been hiding out elsewhere with the Joker. So who the hell was this guy? We don't know, and Jude Winnick apparently didn't care enough to have the logistics of this setup explained. Still, Batman's initial reaction to believing Jason to be dead again, hints Black Mask into realizing that Batman knows who Red Hood is. And Batman talking back to him while inspecting the blown up Red Hood helmet for a new address card then confirms it to him. Batman neither confirms or denies Black Mask's suspicions, and just leaves him to go meet Jason at the next meeting place, which in this case is at Crime Alley on East End District where they first met. There Jason greets Batman while also letting him know that he has the Joker held captive inside one of the buildings that he has rigged to blow up and Batman, true to his principles, refuses to commit murder by inaction on anyone, so he charges at Jason. And at this exact moment, the secret society of supervillains drops chemo from a plane to the neighboring Bloodhaven, which creates a massive green mushroom cloud seen all the way to Batman's and Jason's location in Gotham. And knowing Nightwing had gone back there, causes Batman to refuse accepting that he has lost another one of his sons, while Jason as the prodigal son is being both a realist and a jerk about it, even to the point of refusing to let Batman go inspect the radiated ruins to look for Nightwing. Batman is so forced to deal with Jason and the Joker as quickly and efficiently as Jason clearly wants him to, and as they fight they also weaken their defenses, with Batman also managing to destroy Jason's jacket and all the weapons he has inside it. During the fight that also leads them to one of the apartments inside the building, Batman doesn't only let his fists do the talking, and tries to implore to Jason as his former father figure by a apologizing for his failures on him, including not being able to save him in time. Is that what you think this is about? That you let me die? I don't know what cloud your judgment worse. Your guilt or your antiquated sense of morality. Bruce, I forgive you for not saving me. But why? Why on God's earth? <laughs> is he still alive? <laughs> So, who's got a camera? Ooh, ooh, get one of me and the kid first. Then you and me, then the three of us, and then one with the crowbar. Then... Ah! You be as quiet as possible, or I'll put one in your lap first. Party pooper. No cake for you. Ignoring what he's done in the past, blindly, stupidly disregarding the entire graveyards he's filled, the thousands who have suffered... The friends he's crippled. You know, I thought... I thought I'd be the last person you'd ever let him hurt. If it had been you that he'd beat to a bloody pulp, if he had taken you from this world, I would have done nothing but search the planet for this pathetic pile of evil death-worshipping garbage. And send him off to hell! You don't understand. I don't think you've ever understood. What? What, your moral code just won't allow for that? It's too hard to cross that line. No! God Almighty, no! It'd be too damned easy. All I've ever wanted to do is kill him. A day doesn't go by when I don't think about subjecting him to every horrendous torture he's dealt out to others, and then end him. Aw, oh, so you do think about me. But if I do that, if I allow myself to go down into that place, I'll never come back. 
Why? I'm not talking about killing Penguin, or Scarecrow, or Dent. I'm talking about him. Just him. And doing it because... Because he took me away from you. I can't. I'm sorry. That is so sweet. Well, you won't have a choice. I won't. This is what it's all been about. This. You and me and him. Now is the time you decide. If you won't kill this psychotic piece of filth, I will. If you want to stop me, you're going to have to kill me. I'm going to blow his deranged brains out. And if you want to stop it, you're going to have to shoot me. Right in my face! This is turning out even better than I'd hoped. And so the story ends with Batman refusing to do what he psychologically cannot consciously do to the point where he is forced to fatally wound Jason to make him let go of the Joker, who is just happy that he finally gets to die while taking Batman and Jason with him. By shooting at the C4 explosives Jason had set up with the gun Batman refused to use. Okay, with all seriousness, Under the Hood story is better to be remembered as the story where Jason Todd let Batman know he was back from the grave, rather than as the story where Jason Todd came back from the grave. To be clear, Jud Winnick leaned more towards building up a mystery on who the Red Hood would be with that in media res opening, but then revealing that he is Jason to the audience as soon as the fourth issue of the storyline then made it moot. It doesn't even work on a Hitchcockian way of trying to build tension in waiting for Batman to figure it out or accept it, because that too happens before the story reaches its halfway point. And ultimately, the how of Jason's resurrection is only revealed after the story in Batman Annual issue number 25. Long story attempted to be told short. In the build up to the concurrently happening Infinite Crisis, one of its antagonists, aka Superboy Prime, in his growing frustration, punched the walls of the pocket dimension they were living in, and that ended up causing some ripples to the hypertime. One of those ripples effects were to merge two paralleling timelines together, the main one where Jason died in, and the alternative one where Jason barely survived the warehouse explosion. Unfortunately, the merger of the two timelines happened too late by the time Jason had already been buried, and was revived back to life six feet under. Jason woke to what most people have nightmares about, and was just barely able to escape from his grave with the training given to him, before the rest of the merger finished in making his wounds catch up to him and fall into a coma. Then, as a muscle memory controlled revenant, Jason wandered out of the hospital he was taken to as a John Doe, and eventually through some circumstances was found by Thalia in realizing that Jason was her beloved's lost Robin. Raj told Thalia not to do anything with him in knowing nothing good would come out of letting Batman know about Jason, and in being an expert on how the Lazarus Pit's insanity functions work, refused to let Talia use it to heal Jason's brain damage. Talia being Talia, however, wanted to take this as a chance to make Batman love her, while also probably projecting maternal feelings onto Jason as her beloved's adopted son. And when Raj was taking an another one of his dips to the Lazarus pit, Talia pushed Jason disguised as a guard in there with him, and so Jason was killed from his catatonic state. We had a big day. The rest of what happened was that Jason ignored what happened at the United Nations and just focused on the fact that when the Joker Reef surfaced after the UN incident, Batman just returned him to the police custody. 
feeling that Batman had not avenged him or even tried to, then put Jason into the path to become the Red Hood, which included him to be a part of the Hush storyline during his extra training to 1. Confirm to Hush himself that Bruce Wayne is Batman and 2. Be there at the graveyard to fight Batman before switching players with Clayface and then be offended at Batman being angry at Clayface for violating their memory of him. What the hell is it? What kind of reaction is that supposed to be? Batman was rightfully disgusted at Jason's memory being violated. He openly admitted that he loved Jason like a son, and Jason got offended over it. Well, how did he feel about the point where Batman had convinced himself to try murder the Joker before Commissioner Gordon stopped him? Robert actually suggested that I bring up this following point. That Jason could have been expecting Batman to have a stronger reaction similar to the ones he had in Mudback, where an another version of Clayface caught him off guard relatively early after a death in the family. Or this reaction Batman had during Nightfall when he was tired and fatigued from being forced to catch all of Arkham's inmates that Bane broke out, and then Scarecrow gassed him while also working with the Joker. Jason! 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 By the way, in acknowledging those two instances, no wonder why Batman was more level-headed during Hush and skeptical when Jason finally confirmed to him that he was back to life. In the end, not acknowledging those things or the UN incident from the end of A Death in the Family seems to be done just so Under the Hood could be more about Jason doing bunch of cool anti-hero stuff as Red Hood, while also being all Fuck Batman while the rest of the story tries to happen at the same time as the Infinite Crisis, which brings in even more continuity errors. For example, Kemo being airdropped into Bloodhaven happened in issue 4, with Batman being shown to be at the fridges of it to find Nightwing alive, supposedly after the events of Under the Hood. But in the previous issues, supposedly set before the third act of Under the Hood's climax, Batman should have also gone to inspect the ruins of the Justice League Watchtower and recover its black box, while also being ambushed by Mongul with Superman and Wonder Woman, have returned to the Batcave to format the black box and ignored Alfred's first aid, gotten a panic attack from seeing his brother Ice Omax attacking Tamaskera to slaughter Amazons, been visited by the Earth 2 Superman who tells him about his own Earth 2 counterpart's life, and then learned from the black box that Superboy Prime destroyed the Watchtower. All of that happened before Batman showed up to assist Red Hood in fighting against Captain Nazi, Hyena and Count Vertigo, and Batman was that distracted with Red Hood before he decided to tell anyone else what happened to the Justice League Watchtower. And then there is this cameo with the Joker being told by the Royal Flush Gang that Secret Society of Supervillains doesn't want him to join them, when he is supposed to be held captive by Jason. I also went through Red Hood The Lost Days, which is supposed to be an extended version of Batman Annual issue 25 with Robert for his Protegious Noob series, but it only made both of us realize how much more the continuity was fucked. Holy shit, this doesn't make sense! How can Rage be dead if this is before Hush when Rage was still alive? This was another one of those, like, like, like I keep doing in my videos, like saying, the story moves the characters, but the ca instead the characters of the characters doing the story moving up on their own. Uh, this was clearly that. This is clearly one carrying the other. It's just, I just, uh, I think Judd forgot. I think he mixed up what happened pre-Hush and what happened post-Hush. Also, that series was overly long with half of it being too padded, which you can learn more about from the full video on Robert's channel. And one more thing that happens in it justifies a third Ismolaitala cutaway gag. Hey, hell of a
And I have not even commented about the art or the fact that Under the Hood started out with Dog Monk, whose art we previously saw in the Superman vs. the Elite video. But then the second act we also had Paul Lee fill in for one issue, Shane Davis for another issue in Act 3 along with the Annual, and Eric Battle for the final two issues. Your mileage may vary, but the shifting art style somewhat signals of a rushed production that was being fueled just by Goodwinnick's great idea of bringing Jason Dude back from the grave as an anti-villain. This is why, while writing this script, I have grown more okay on the fact that the 2010 adaptation that got Red added to it might as well be the needed rewrite and remake that cut out the unnecessary fat out from the comic and maintains a consistent animation and art style. I would like to say that I am optimistic in believing under the Red Hood being a better version of the story, but remembering how I started this Jason Todd trilogy by first covering a death in the family and its bare minimum adaptation that was done a decade later and wasn't what Crisis Core was to Final Fantasy VII, I unfortunately know better. Okay, let's start with the fat that got cut out. No Mr. Freeze to confuse those audience members expecting him to be working to cure his wife, no stolen kryptonite, no Deathstroke representing the secret society of supervillains, no Zatanna, Jason Blood, Green Arrow and Superman cameos, no Onyx, no Infinite Crisis tie-in, no Superboy Prime punching any walls, no Sheila in the flashbacks of Jason's death, no Batman confronting the Joker after Jason's death, and now you are cutting out the story's muscle there instead of its fat jud. That is what I would recognize as this movie's main weakness. The fact that it had to compress the story from being told concurrently with the mainstream DC Comics continuity into being a standalone story on which it already fails at by needing to have a death in the family to have happened before it. Without it, Judwinik ended up needing to write an opening prologue where Jason is killed by the Joker as Robin, aka this is exactly what I talked about in my A Death in the Family video. It along with Jason's other scenes as Robin in the movie summarizes and simplifies Jason's time as Robin to be known for just one thing without paying proper attention to what led to that one thing. Again, the animated death in the family movie could have pulled a crisis score in telling that story later as a proper prequel, but we all know what happened instead. Actually, when looking at the opening of this movie, I believe that had Sheila been included to help Jason reach the locked door, that maybe could have given them time to work on opening the lock before the time bomb reached zero. However, without an incident showing what happened between Batman and the Joker after Jason died, and how Batman mourned Jason's death before moving on, the story ends up feeling incomplete with the attempts to fill in the needed gaps then committing the ultimate sin of visual storytelling. Show, don't tell. Especially when the Jason as Robin flashbacks are restricted to a few random scenes pulled from issue 645. But at one point when Batman and Alfred are talking about Jason's life on the streets before being taken in as the new Robin, 
We are just told of his juvenile behavior without any references that could have served as a similar example of Jason's violent tendencies as the diplomat's son was. And if Batman still wasn't sure if Jason pushed Philippe Garzonas off the balcony or not. I still don't want to be too mean at this movie, because I can recognize that somewhere between the source material and the movie itself, there can be found a perfect version of Under the Hood, with the right things cut out and the right things left in. For that reason, I should probably try to format this part in talking about the movie into pros and cons. Pro. The voice acting from Bruce Greenwood, Jensen Ackles and John DiMaggio as Batman, Red Hood and the Joker are what make this movie, and they make their scenes together work. The fact that I let their voice lines carry the ending of the story commentary should make that obvious. Khan. The writing on the side characters does not work when they are made to be audience surrogates. Early on in the present day, when Batman and Nightwing are hunting down the smugglers, one of them has to explain to the other that Nightwing used to be the first Robin as if it was common knowledge. Who's that other one? The pretty boy in the leotard. That's Nightwing. He was the Bat's first sidekick. The first Robin. How does that guy know that? Whereas Nightwing, when Amazo attacks him and Batman for the action set piece, acts out like how the audience is expected to react to Amazo. I think you'll have to do better than that, boss. I did. You know he could fly? Boom! Be offended by a few suggestions. He has the same weak points as a human being. Got it. This might sting a bit. Lasers. He's got lasers. But I don't think putty in his eyes is gonna hurt him. But plastique will. Nice. No. So you want me to? Should I? Okay. I'll just take care of this. I'm chatty as part of my charm. None of that is funny. Trying to be funny like that only makes it come across as transparent and out of place. Bro. Since the story had to be compressed, some scenes were given proper chances to... Well, not the scenes exactly, but the pacing of the story by having it be told more fluently, instead of jumping back and forth between two scenes. For those of you who might not have noticed this during the story commentary, I decided to compress and edit most of the scenes so that they were easier to narrate. And that is also why I ended up cutting out this scene in not being able to explain or narrate it. So that is a plus for the movie, however... Khan. This fluidity in attempting to cut out surplus scenes ended up removing characterization from certain characters, and ends up simplifying them into stereotypes who don't talk like normal people, or make them reach conclusions without provided context. Black Mask is an example of this by being turned into a victim of flanderization, where while the references of his rise to power thanks to war games could be unnecessary, and just asking us to accept when told that he is the head of Gotham's organized crime work as a substitute, the comic story had his characterization start out as a cool-headed and smart crime boss, to leading up to his eventually growing anger and frustration with Red for destroying his businesses. I showcased examples of this with Robert reading some of his lines during the story commentary. Unfortunately in this movie he is just portrayed one-dimensionally as an angry crime boss most of the time. Amazo was going to buy my way up into high-end international trafficking. Now I'm forced to keep rooting around in this local leg-breaking garbage! And he gives me back trouble! This Who is blows the ex. damn robot's head off? I could have at least sold it for scrap, but Batman kept it. This is an exposition yes, dump. Beaten, broken, his head mounted on my wall, kinda dead. Rough up his business, something big, something loud. When he shows up to shut us down, have a party waiting for him. And when I say party, I actually mean a whole lot of people who are gonna kill him. I figured. Just I be <laughs> Wanna tell me why this guy ain't dead? We're trying. Not we sent the fearsome hand of four. Four? 
Guess they're gonna need a new name. Oh! Why hasn't Batman wiped this little smear off the face of the planet? And for funnies, he was also implied to have a short-term memory loss when calmer. This circus act. This Redfoot. Redfoot. Whatever. <laughs> Then there is the aspect of how Batman is made to realize that Red Hood is Jason, which I am not sure how to balance it. There are improvements to it, but with the cut-out scenes for the sake of the runtime, the characterization for Batman comes across as strange when we never got to see how he dealt with the loss during the five-year gap. In the comic, we know what Batman has been doing since a death in the family, how he had to pick himself back up from it, as well as how the memory of Jason's death had impacted him after it happened. That is why when confronted by Jason in the in-media rest scene, as well as when being led there, Batman is portrayed to be suspicious and doubtful to the point where he only came to accept it when Jason gave him DNA evidence. Also, the fact that Batman learned of Jason's body being stolen from his grave during the Hush story could have made Batman be expecting Jason to be brought back to haunt him in some form sooner or later. In the movie, it takes being called Bruce after seeing Red Hood showcase moves that Batman had taught to Jason as Robin that seems to make Batman immediately jump at conclusions of the Red Hood being Jason. Then instead of showing Batman trying to comprehend how this could be, he instead goes to assist the Red Hood in fighting against mercenaries who were created for this movie to replace Captain Nazi Hyena and Count Vertigo. I want to imagine that Batman is acting on father's instincts in believing Red Hood to be his lost son, in contrast to how Batman already knew that Red Hood was Jason in the comic, and he was also attempting to get some more intel by not not being hostile against him. Anyway, that fight leads to Red Hood leaving behind some DNA that Batman eventually does pick up and then confirms with it that Red Hood is Jason. Like in the comic, Bruce and Alfred have Jason's grave dug open, and if a buried corpse looks that good five years after being put into the ground, then that should make it obvious that it's a puppet. Seeing how at this point we are past Deathstroke and the Secret Society of Supervillains coming to assist Black Mask after Red Hood bazooka his building, that happens while Batman goes to interrogate Raj Al Ghul about the rewritten events of the annual issue, and since Black Mask can't get help from Deathstroke and the Secret Society in the movie, he, for some reason, decides to ask help from the Joker who has been locked up in Arkham for the most of the present day scenes. After Batman has learned from Raj that he wanted to try reviving Jason closely after his death for better chances of resurrection, and so stole his remains by replacing the body with the puppet when they transferred back to Gotham, that still didn't matter because the story needed to have Jason come back wrong, and apparently Raj never found Jason after he fled high on the madness. We don't get Talia's account on the events as she is reduced into being a voiceless background character, and if she helped Jason in any way to become Red Hood like in the annual issue or in Lost Days, we have no frame of reference to that in the movie. By the time Batman then returns to Gotham, the Joker released from Arkham by Black Mask has set up a scene at Gotham Bridge to lure the Red Hood out, which turns out being what the Red Hood wanted all along, and this is something I must recognize as an attempted improvement in the movie, because it adds a method to what Jason was doing in going after Black Mask. In the comic, Red Hood was going after Black Mask more or less because he was the head of Gotham's organized crime, but in this movie he was doing that to egg Black Mask into getting the Joker out of our common after Red Hood. I failed to see how that was an option on the table, but I'll take it. Long story short, Red Hood manages to get the Joker into his captivity, and he then eventually contacts Batman to come meet him at Crime Alley where they had first met. The rest of the movie is then pretty much a combined retelling of the end of Act 2 and 3 from the story commentary, without Kimo being dropped into Bloodhaven in the middle of it, and the building where the climax is happening is not told to be rigged with explosives until after they have been set to go off. Also, 
There is a very much welcome fix to the standoff situation where Jason forces Batman to either shoot the Joker or himself. Where Batman instead bluffs Jason into shooting him instead by turning his back on him and countering the shot with a well-timed dodge before throwing a batarang to jam Jason's gun. This change prevents Batman from fatally wounding Jason as his son like in the comic, while also keeping him from coming across as a hypocrite in claiming to be psychologically unable to commit murder. Also, as the movie in an earlier scene arc welded the killing joke to be the Joker's backstory, him telling Batman, I'm the only one who's gonna get what he wants tonight! could unintentionally support my headcanon from what I previously covered in The Killing Joke, aka the fact that the Joker wants to die while not being mentally strong enough to do it himself, which is why he keeps doing what he does to give his victims and their loved ones a reason to kill him. Batman especially, because the Joker sees Batman as the catalyst for his current form of existence, but with Jason's actions in this movie, the Joker would be given what he wants while all also taking Batman out with him. That way, when Batman then in the explosion's aftermath discovers the Joker alive and weakly laughing, he is really crying over on another failed attempt. This doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything at all. Like I said previously, I want to believe that somewhere between these two versions of Under the Hood, there can exist a version of it that cuts out the unnecessary parts from the comic and fills in the gaps done to the movie when Jude Winnick had to compress it into 75 minutes, while also needing to acknowledge a death in the family as background context. Both versions of the story, however, also showcase the lack of foresight in what was supposed to come after it was told. In the comics after Under the Hood ended, DC pulled off the one year later act by jumping all of their titles one year to the future. And the next time we saw Jason Todd was in the pages of Nightwing as a deuterologist in the next storyline, while Batman himself didn't come across the Red Hood until at the end of Green Arrow's then current run. Then there were the events of Batman R.A.P., Battle of the Cowl, Return of Bruce Wayne, Batman Incorporated, and so on until the New 52 happened. Unlike an untold amount of other DC characters who ended up suffering from the New 52's changes, Jason Todd as Red Hood ended up being one of those characters who benefited from it by having Scott Lobdell take over the character. Red Hood and the Outlaws on its first outing during the New 52 was not very favorably received, especially when looking at Roy Harper and Starfire in that series, but Lobdell was still able to reinvent Jason's personality to have mellowed down to be less angry at Batman and the rest of the Bat family, as well as have him move on in his life when not wearing the Red Hood helmet. When reaching the DC Rebirth, Lobdell tried again seemingly having learned from his mistakes, by teaming Jason up with Artemis of Banamigdal and Bizarro as his new outlaws. Jason's working relationship with Batman and the Bat family had also warmed up to him seeing them as his father, brothers and sister following the continuity reboot. And if we lived in a perfect world, that status quo would be where his life was left to land on. But since conflict-free life is boring to write, that family dynamic ended up getting broken more than once after it was built. At the time of the writing, DC is currently going through the Gotham War between Batman Batman and Catwoman, with Jason having picked Catwoman's side, to which Batman then responded by doing to Jason what was done to him during Identity Crisis flashbacks. I have no idea how Gotham War is eventually going to end, but knowing how DC's current writers are too lazy to fix what they break, Jason might end up being damaged goods for now, and while waiting for another writer's fix-up that might not even happen. I'll end my Jason Todd trilogy here on these panels of him and Bruce eating hamburgers on a break and having a moment as a father and son.